Well, good morning, Gordon. Uh, welcome to uh, a new week. And you know, one of the best parts about being chaplain is I get to invite people who I really love and admire to come and speak. So um, how many of you were born in New York City? Anybody born in New York City? Thank you. All right, today, we're, which borough? Which borough? Bronx? Queens. Queens. All right, today you are hearing Staten Island introduce Brooklyn. All right, so we, what are we missing? Manhattan. Anyone from Manhattan? There we go. Thank you. All right. Hey, uh, this morning it is uh, my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce the Reverend Dr. Bruce Boria. Uh, Bruce is the senior pastor at uh, Bethany Church up in Greenlee, New Hampshire. He's in his 20th year there. Bethany is a, uh, during Bruce's time there, has become a multi-site with uh, campuses in Ramey, New Hampshire and Kittery Point, Maine. Bruce uh, is just the real deal. What you see is what you get. What you hear is from his heart. He's a dad, he's a grandfather, he's um, just still recovering from going to, having two of his sons get married in very short order, <laughs> just about a month ago. Uh, but Bruce is my pastor, and he is a man who is all about disciples making disciples because that is our call as Christians, right? To duplicate ourselves, to be disciples making disciples. Bruce drives around on a motorcycle, his motorcycle, Corey says, Bruce is here, I just saw his bike pull in. Um, but uh, it is my pleasure to introduce not only my pastor, but my very good friend, Bruce Boria. All right, before I start, I just want to set the record straight. It's hot in here, and all the hot air is not coming from the front, okay? So, like, when you leave, it was already warm before I got here, all right? He did say, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a grandfather. I'm also broke, because all my kids spent all my money on these weddings. <laughs> but I love them anyway. Hey, have you ever had... Uh, um, a moment where you were so engrossed in an activity that without any really any apparent provocation, some unwelcome memory just surfaces. It's like something just triggers a deeply held secret or maybe it's a regrettable decision. It just seems to step out from the corners of your mind from its shadows. And when that happens, the memory is so intense that it physically affects you. Like, in fact, if you're hanging around some of your friends in that moment, they kind of look at you and go, hey, uh, everything okay? Uh, you know, are you all right? You know, the older I get, the keener my awareness of, a, of the ravaging effects that a troubled past, a unresolved past, can have on a life. It can suffocate you. It can rob the present and the future of love and joy and peace. Because guilt can paralyze you and regret, it can block the road to healing. Shame becomes a prison that you just erect for yourself. And it just keeps you from living life free. We go around praying that this lock that we put on these doors to unwelcome memories just holds tight. Because you never want this stuff coming out. So I just wanted to just posit this thought and in light of this song that you just sang, right? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I, I just wanted to posit this thought in your mind that wouldn't it be great to break free from those kinds of chains? Whatever it is that brings this level of anxiety into your life, that this relationship with Jesus has a way to resolve that for you. There's a great passage that I want to have you walk with me through. It's found in 
John chapter 21. It's a text that kind of unfolds a story of redemption. And I believe it's a story that could be your story. The Gospel of John up to this point has taken us through the accounts of Jesus' life to the point where he has been betrayed and arrested, scourged, crucified, and resurrected. The disciples have seen Jesus now. They have talked to him. But now that he has risen from the dead, it's, okay, what's next? So much of their life was following Jesus and being an eyewitness to his miracles and to hearing his messages of encouragement, you know, the unfolding of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But now he is physically removed from them. And they're going to have to find a rhythm and a pattern to their life if they're going to continue. And um, how are you going to continue without this visible presence of Jesus? How are you going to live in light of this resurrection? And it appears that it was kind of difficult for these disciples, especially in the beginning. And so I wanted to talk to you about how they, how this was overcome. And uh, the question I have is then, like, what are the steps that we're to take to experience this abundant life that Jesus promised? goes down to start at John 21 verse 3 all the disciples had gathered together and they were talking back and forth and then Peter just blurts out and says I'm going to go fish and the rest of them said well we'll go with you and so they went and got out into the boat and that night they caught nothing not quite the diversion they thought it was going to be perhaps They were just feeling as empty as their nets. They come back, and then it says in verse 4 that early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Now, what I want you to think about here is that Jesus is orchestrating this whole event. Jesus knows the end from the beginning, right? So everything that's going on, Jesus is purposeful in the way in which this whole scene and everything is going to unfold. And um, one of the first things is that um, Jesus wants to remind them of something. In John uh, 21, 5 and 6, it says, Jesus calls out to them and he says, friends, have you any fish? And they answered, no. He says, well, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, They were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. So when that happened, I am certain that it probably triggered in their memory the first time that that happened. When Jesus was standing by the shore and teaching everyone and the crowds began to gather and so he saw some boats and he got into the boat and they pushed it out and he spoke to everyone and then when he was finished he looked at the disciples at that time just Andrew, Peter, James, John and said hey um, why don't you take this boat out and cast your net for some fish and if you know the story it's back in Luke it says that they looked at Jesus and said master he said we've been out all night man we haven't caught a thing and he says well just go out into the deeper water he says let down your net And they said, well, because you asked us. Maybe something about Jesus, his temperament, the way he was, I don't know, it just gave them enough to just say, okay, usually go out fishing at night, but you're telling me to do it now, so we go. And you know the story, right? They catch so much fish, the boat begins to sink, so much so that they have to call to James and John to come bring their boat, and then all the fish is transferred over and their boat begins to sink. And Peter falls on his face, And he says, Lord, depart from me. I'm an unclean man. And Jesus looked at them and said, come, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, why do I say that? Because the experience, no doubt, triggered that. Because look what happens. In verse 7, it says, then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. 
And Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, and he wrapped his garment, and he throws himself into the water, and they come towing this boat in, full of fish, from the shore. But Jesus is still done with the lessons, because now I want you to notice in the text that when he comes, he lands, and this is now verse 9, it says, they saw a fire with burning coals, with fish on it, and some bread. I don't want you to lose sight of this. There was a fire and there was some bread. And then Jesus brought some fish that they had caught. But there's something more in mind here than just a simple breakfast reunion, right? There, there, there is, again, this particular that I just want you to notice because in the life of Peter, can you think of anything that may have been a trigger for him in terms of bread? It says in the text here, if you look at it, right, in verse 13, it says, Jesus took the bread, gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. When was the last time Jesus took bread and gave it to his disciples? It wasn't that long ago. They were sitting around celebrating the Passover meal. Jesus gathers them all together, and then what does he do? In the midst of this this um, celebration that has been going on for quite a long millennia, you know, a few millennia, right? Going back on the day when God would deliver the nation of Israel out of Egypt, this Passover lamb, Jesus now takes this bread and he breaks it and he gives thanks. He tells them, this is my body now which is broken for you. This redemption is gonna flow through the lamb of God now. His broken body is going to be the payment for your sin and for mine. He's going to live up to that name by which he was given at his conception, right? Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. So now he takes this bread and he gives it to them. And they give thanks. When Jesus now reminded them that they were called and now somehow here, I think in this whole thing, they're going back into this moment. But there's something else about that Passover. Remember what happens after they celebrated the, the bread and the cup? Well, let me remind you here. In Matthew 26, it says that Jesus said to them, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. See, I'm saying it's entirely possible that they needed to be reminded of God's grace. They were in this space and no doubt being overcome by all of these little triggers now. Jesus resurrected, he has called them, but now they're out fishing. And he's saying, do you forget that I called you to be fishers of men? But why this bread analogy? Because what also took place on this day was they all needed to hear this word of redemption, but Peter in particular, because in that setting, it says in verse, in uh, Matthew 26, it says, Peter replies, if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, Jesus says, you're going to disown me three times. And Peter kind of blurts out, well, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Really, Peter? Because it's not long after that that we read in John 18 some of the surrounding story, right? It says that Jesus follows, I mean, uh, Peter follows Jesus as he's being interrogated by the Sanhedrin. And he's standing outside, and what's outside but a fire? And he's outside warming himself in this fire. And a woman comes up to him and says, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And he replies, I am not. And again, it says it was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. And so Simon Peter stood warming himself and he asked, you're not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it again. And then one of the high priest's servants challenged him, didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? And again, Peter at the, you know, cries out, I, and he denies it, right? And it says, and at that moment, a rooster began to crow. 
Matthew gives us a little bit more insight and he says, it was at that moment that Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you're gonna disown me three times. Now, I don't think I'm just reading more into this passage. I'm not, I'm not trying to just make a sermon out of nothing, but I do think that them throwing out this net and all of a sudden it being filled with fish, that Jesus invites them in and he's got this fire going and this bread going. And if you have any doubt, then look at what comes next. Because what happened next, I think, removes any doubt that Jesus is on a mission. Because in John 21, it says, when they had finished eating, Jesus now takes Simon Peter. And what does he do? It says, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And Peter replies, yes, Lord. And he says, well, then feed my lambs. And again, the Lord asks him, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He says, well, then take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. And then he said to him, follow me. See, Jesus again is orchestrating a scenario for Peter. Peter is being asked to declare his allegiance to Jesus. Do you really love me? Three times. I think to balance the three times that he just finished denying him. And every time he's asking him, do you love me? Peter has to revisit again that denial. In his head, he has to remember that day that he stood on that cold night just not long ago, right? Days, probably. And now he's sitting there and this flood of memory comes to the surface again at that one moment when he was being asked with all the bravado about, I'll never deny you, oh, I'll follow you, other ones won't. And Jesus saying, really, do you love me more than these? And Jesus is being deliberate. And you say, well, why do you do that? Why do you put your finger in this sore spot? Why are you pouring salt on this open wound? Well, that's a really good question. But I think that the answer to this has less to do with Peter's past than it has more to do with his future. Jesus knows that Peter's past could cripple him. It could hold him back. It could keep him captive, keeping him from fulfilling his calling. I think Jesus is showing up on that, on that shore because he wants to rescue Peter from his past, to redirect him, to set him free. Jesus is saying to Peter, hey, become the fisher of man I called you to be. Become the rock that I know you are. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. See, Jesus' words demonstrate love and affirmation for Peter. Because it's not that you're just called, it's not that you're just forgiven, but Peter, I called you to serve me. I didn't call you because you were perfect. I didn't call you, even in all those years that they spent ministry together, how many times did he want to just slap them upside the head? You know it's true. Just, Jesus is doing these tremendous miracles and they're sitting around fighting about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Really. So, on that day when Jesus is on that beach, I think it's a, it's a whole rescue mission. Because here's a true thing, and many of you guys already know this intuitively, and you're going to realize it even deeper the older you get, that there is a huge danger in allowing your past to define you, to keep you from embracing all that God has for you, to place you on the sidelines. Jesus doesn't want your past to define you. Rather, Jesus is lifting the fog that oftentimes prevents us from seeing the possibilities from seeing his provision of grace and power. 
because he wants you to take your guilt and your regret and shame and nail it on the cross where it belongs. It's not meant to define you. He already knows that we're sinners. He already knows that the natural inclination of our heart is to do our own thing. And all the amount of self-reflection and, and turning inward, it's not going to rescue you. Because, listen to this, it, Peter on his own is out there fishing. God's saying, I called you to do something else. No, we need a word of God. We need the presence of God to come into my life and remind me again of this treasure that is mine because I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Sins are forgiven. The way in which we think, the way in which we engage this world, the way in which we filter all the information that's coming at us is going to be a testimony about how I am waiting on God. The journey is an inward. The journey is allowing God to speak into my life and redirect me. Because on my own, I might run down paths that are never going to lead me where I think they're going to. Like it, it's like an old proverb that says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. If we knew all the answers, then why do we need Jesus? Why submit to his rule and authority over my life because I need him to, to speak into my life when I've made some poor choices, to bring me a word of wisdom when I'm in confusion. And all of which, not just so that you could be this happy little camper, but because you and me, we're plan A. We're the plan A that goes out into the world and your faith has to make a difference. It looks kind of cute on a little slogan, you know, creating ripples, that sounds great. But it's your life in all those moments and all those interactions where you get the opportunity to reflect something of the grace and the glory of Jesus in the way in which you treat all people. The way in which you go that second mile the way you turn that other cheek, the way you allow Jesus to address all of your own assumptions and presuppositions and says, hey, let me give you the mind of Christ so that you never lose sight of what is true and right, that you don't overestimate progress and underestimate evil. One of the habits I got into was just reminding myself of words of saints who have gone before. Because we all, we all enter into the same kind of experience. And the more older you get, you just realize the world is still just as jacked up as it ever has been. And then you meet people the influence of Jesus in their life is so palpable that when you're around them you just can't help but say I, I want to be like that you could be that person for someone else but you're not going to be that person if you're holding on to a whole lot of baggage if inside that voice of yours is always bringing up all the disappointments, all the things that you couldn't do all the things that you think you should have been doing like all of that noise It's enough for you to know that God chose you. He loves you. And your path, it's unique to you. But all those paths together are bringing us together so that we manifest to the world what it means to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. I one time read words from a martyred saint in Africa. He was killed during the reign of Idi Amin. It went back to his village where many of the women were absconded and the men were slaughtered. And they went into this pastor's little room where he did his studying and they found his Bible and they found this note that he had handwritten. It was a covenant that he made 
between him and God. I memorize those words because I want to live those words. You know what he said? He said, I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I have crossed the line. I am a disciple of Jesus. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. And my future is redeemed. I will not look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed vision, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need prosperity. Post, you know, um, I don't need posterity, I don't need preeminence, I don't need promotions, positions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, tops, first, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on his understanding, walk in patience, live by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set. My goal is heaven. My companions few, my guide reliable. My road is rough, the way is narrow, but my mission is clear. I will not be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder in the pool of popularity, or meander in a maze of mediocrity. I will not give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, praised up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I will go till he comes, give till I drop, work till he stops me. And when he comes back for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. That kind of life is a life that takes seriously the words of Jesus who just says, come, follow me. Your walk with Jesus will bring healing, not just to you, but you're going to be a wounded healer that goes out into the world with a greater sensitivity for the hurts and the challenges. Only do so without all the baggage. You don't go out there trying to earn his approval. He loved you and demonstrated his love for you by giving his life on a cross. Now, my friends, when you leave, You leave just bathed in the grace of God and for no other reason, because none of us are that good. Amen? Amen.